Amen. And aren't you thankful that today Christ is risen? That's what we're here to celebrate. Amen. That's what we're here to do is, folks, because of what Jesus did, going to the cross for our sins, but not only going to the cross, but then coming out of that tomb, we know that we have victory over death if we know Jesus Christ. Amen. And I hope and pray this morning you can come and you can praise God for that victory that you have in your life. And I hope and pray this morning if you're here and you haven't experienced that, that before you leave today, you'll know what it means to have victory over death in Jesus Christ. We know it's the greatest thing that can ever happen to anybody. Amen. Come to know Jesus, having our sins forgiven us, knowing that we have heaven as our eternal home. So I hope and pray that today you will celebrate with us. This song is Christ is Risen. And the message of it is so great, there's a line in it in the chorus. It says, Christ is risen from the dead, trampling over death by death. And I love that line. Jesus put death to death by his death. Amen. So let's praise him for that this morning as we sing Christ is Risen. Oh uh -huh. 
Let's pray together, y'all, and let's praise him for that. Father, we thank you so much today that Christ is risen from the dead. And Lord, we come here not just to follow a ritual, Lord, not just because it's what we're supposed to do, but we come here with joy in our heart, knowing that Jesus is alive and well. He's alive and well at your right hand. And Father, for those of us who know you, he is alive and well in our heart today. Father, thank you for your presence in our life. Thank you for your conquering power over sin. And Father, we pray as we continue to worship this morning, that Lord, the, the presence of God would just be very real in this place and in our lives. Father, I just pray now that our hearts are sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And Father, that we are just open to the truth of your word. We love you, Father, and we give you the honor and glory and praise. We ask these things in Jesus' name. And amen. 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 He is alive. Take your Bible this morning. And let us go to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. And Luke shares with us that Jesus Christ is alive. Amen? Amen. Luke chapter 24, beginning in verse 1. Now, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. And then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to the rest. He is alive today. That is what we have come here to celebrate. Several years ago, there was a, an article in the USA Today newspaper about how Christianity was exploding in China, even though the government was opposed. And there was a 21-year-old Chinese girl who was interviewed for that newspaper article, and uh, she was telling why she was interested in studying the Bible. She said she didn't want to go to church just to have some preacher stand up and tell her how to be nice. She said, and I quote, I need to know why Jesus died. I want to know why he died. Well, today I want to respond to that request and ask you to take your Bible just for a moment and go to the book of Hebrews. And I want you to go to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. And I want to tell you about why Jesus died. And I want to encapsulate the entire weekend of Good Friday to Easter Sunday by telling you why Jesus died. Here's what Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22 has to say to us. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22 and here is what it says. It says, according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. You know that the story of redemption begins in the very first pages of the Bible when God makes Adam and Eve, creating them in his own image for a relationship with himself and putting them into the Garden of Eden. But you know that it's not too long after they are placed in the Garden of Eden that something happens. They sin against God. They violate God's law. They violate God's command. And they sin and they realize that they are unclothed. They realize they're filled with shame. And they are overcome with this amazing amount of guilt because of what they have done. They are separated from the Lord. You'll remember how they try to cover that shame and cover their guilt by making fig leaves to clothe themselves. But that doesn't do the trick. They don't know what they're going to do to somehow cover their shame. But God knows how to cover their guilt. God knows how to cover their shame. And what God does is He takes the, an innocent animal... And he takes that innocent animal, takes its life, and from that animal makes for them garments and clothing. And Genesis 3.21 says, God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. Now that is the first episode we have in Scripture of an innocent animal giving its life, or its life being taken, and then it being used as a substitute for something else. But what God was doing in Genesis chapter 3 with Adam and Eve is teaching them a very fundamental principle that you find running all through Scripture, and 
that is that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Well, it's not too long after Adam and Eve had that experience with God. They're, of course, kicked out of the Garden of Eden. But then they uh, begin to have a family, and they, uh, uh, they have a firstborn son, and they name him Cain. And they start raising Cain. And I, it was probably tough when they started raising Cain. Well, it wasn't too long after that. They had another son, and his name was Abel. And there was some conflict between the two boys. There was some, uh, I'm sure, some personality quirks and conflicts because Cain uh, grew up to be a gardener and Abel grew up to be a shepherd. And they too were sinners. They too had sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And they instinctively knew they needed to bring some kind of an offering to God. And you'll remember how Cain brings some vegetables to the Lord and then Abel brings one of his flocks to the Lord and how God looks at Cain's offering and he looks at it in a negative way, but he looks at Abel's offering and it's an acceptable offering. Now you may, want, you may say, well, why did God not accept Cain's offering? He's giving him his best. He's giving him of the garden. Well, uh, if I were being a facetious fellow today, I would say it's because you can't get blood from a turnip and that's why he didn't do it. But that's not really the reason. The reason that he accepted Cain, uh, Abel's offering and not Cain is because Abel had taken in the last and I'm sure that Adam and Eve had given him and that lesson was that without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness of sin and that God required a blood sacrifice and God received uh, Abel's offering and not Cain's because of that very simple reason. Well, you can follow that line all throughout the Old Testament. You can go over to Genesis chapter 22 where Abraham and Sarah have this son of promise whose name is Isaac. And I'm telling you, Abraham loved that boy Isaac. He was the apple of his eye. And sometimes we parents have a way of idolizing our children and maybe even making our children uh, sort of into a, uh, a position or putting them in a position that they shouldn't be in. We can make them a substitute for God. I don't know if Abraham did that or not, but I do know this, that God put Abraham to the test. And what he did, he said, I want you to take your son of promise, your only son of promise, Isaac, and I want you to take him on Mount Moriah, and I want you to offer him as a sacrifice. Well, Isaac wasn't privy to all that was going on, but he did go up Mount Moriah with his dad. And when he got up on the slopes there of Mount Moriah, he found an altar. And he said to his father, look, dad, here's the altar, and here's the wood, and here's the knife, but where's the lamb? Where's the sacrifice? And Abraham could only say, God will provide the sacrifice. Well, just before Abraham was ready to take that knife and plunge it into the heart of his son of promise, Isaac, you'll remember how God stopped him at that point and said, Now I know that you fear me. Don't harm your son. And he looked over, told Abraham to look over, and he looked over in a thicket. And in this thicket, there was a ram caught in the thicket by, in the thorns by its horns. And that was the sacrifice that Abraham offered there on the slopes of Mount Moriah. And what was God doing in that moment? God was reminding Abraham and teaching Isaac that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission or forgiveness of sin. Let me also remind you guys this morning that where Abraham offered Isaac or was going to offer Isaac on the slopes of Mount Moriah, that is in the same set of hills, the same place where Jesus, thousands of years later, would go up on Mount Moriah, hang on a cross, die between heaven and earth, because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. That's what God had been teaching them for all of those years. You can keep on tracing that story forward to the life of Moses. And you'll remember how during Moses' day, God called Moses to lead the children of Israel out of bondage in Egypt. Y'all remember that story? They had been enslaved in Egypt for a long time. And Moses is to lead them out. Well, you'll remember how God said, Moses, go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And so he goes and says, Pharaoh, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, not going to do it. I'm not letting those people go. And God says, oh, yes, you will. You just don't know how it's going to happen. And God sent all these plagues upon Egypt. And do y'all remember how the very last of those plagues was the death of the firstborn? Do y'all remember that? And do y'all remember how God told the Israelites, he said, here's what you guys need to do. Y'all need to take a lamb without spot and without blemish. You need to kill that lamb in the doorway of your house. You need to take some of the blood on a hyssop branch and you need to put it on the top of the door and on the side of the door and then when the death angel comes through the land to take the firstborn of animals and children of everybody that's not covered by blood, your house will be passed over because your house is covered by blood. That's why we call it the Passover event. The death angel passes over. Well understand that what he was doing in those days was reminding the Israelites once again, just as he did with Adam and Eve, just as he did with 
with Cain and Abel, just as he did with Abraham, that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. You can trace that on through the Old Testament when the Israelites finally do get freed from Egypt. They begin to head out across the wilderness in their wilderness wanderings, and they worship in this thing called the tabernacle. It's like a portable church. It's a portable tent, and they worship in the tabernacle. And they worship in that thing all of the all of the time and they offer all kinds of sacrifices out there but one of the highest and holiest days of the year is Yom Kippur the day of atonement and on Yom Kippur they would do something very interesting the high priest would select two goats or two rams and he would take those and he would have one of them that would be slain for the sins of the nation the other one that would run out into the woods they would set it free it was known as a scapegoat and the idea was that because your sins are forgiven you're free you're rushing out you're going out in your life free and what God was doing once again on the day of atonement was teaching them without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness of sin and what God was trying to do was to condition them and train them so that one day when the prophets had prophesied and when the law had been followed and the people had been trained that God one day would send a forerunner into the world we know him as John the Baptist and John the Baptist would see Jesus coming to the Jordan River and he would say of Jesus Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And what God was trying to do was condition His people to receive Christ when He came to give His life for their sins. He was trying to train them. Now let me just remind you guys, y'all are trainable, whether you believe it or not. You guys remember about Pavlov and his dogs? Y'all remember how Pavlov famously, the psychologist, would go out and he would ring a little bell and then he'd feed the dog. He would ring a little bell and he would feed the dog. He would ring a little bell and he would feed the dog. And then finally, he would ring his little bell, and he wouldn't feed the dog. But even though he didn't feed the dog, the dog would still be salivating because the dog had become conditioned to hearing the bell, getting the food, hearing the bell, getting the food, and it was a conditioned response. And you guys are just like Pavlov's dog. You are as trainable as anybody I know. You are, I'm just telling you, you guys are ultimately trainable. And you say, I don't believe that. Yes, you are. I'm a graduate of Mississippi State University. And when I go to a football game down there and we score a touchdown, you have thousands of people ringing cowbells, man. We're just ringing our cowbells. I don't normally just go into Walmart and ring a cowbell. But I'm conditioned when we score a touchdown, ring a cowbell. If you guys are Auburn fans and they score a touchdown, you're, you're conditioned to say, what, War Eagle or whatever, and you yell, War Eagle. Or if you're an Alabama fan and they score a touchdown, you yell, Roll Tide. Or if you're a Tennessee fan and score a touchdown, well, they never scored a touchdown. But, <laughs> but if they do score a touchdown, you stand up and saying, I stand amazed in the presence, I guess, when they score a touchdown. <laughs> But the point is, you guys are conditioned to do that kind of thing. Am I right? And you guys do it all the time. Some of you this morning are acting in a conditioned way right now because some of you are trying to fake out Brother Marty and pretend that you are reading your Bible on your phone. But I know better. I know that that's not true of all of you. For some it is, but for some of you it's not. Some of you have gotten a notification on that phone and you've got to see what Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and you know Amazon or whatever says. And those people have conditioned you to hear the little ding, to feel the little buzz. And oh my goodness, that's going, I'm going to die if I don't know what it is. And so you've got to look at that thing because they have trained you. And so if you've not answered your phone in a very you know, long period of time, they'll send you a notification because they want to get back in touch with you so they can lead you to buy junk you don't need for people you don't like with money you don't have and you have been trained to do that by those people who operate those social media companies am I right about that we are trainable kinds of people but what God was doing in the Old Testament is that he was training people to one day come uh, to a place where when John the Baptist said behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world they would say yes that is Messiah and we are able to be conditioned. By the way, I told the 8 o'clock service this morning, several years ago, we were over in Israel, and our Jewish uh, guide, who is a wonderful man, graduate of Hebrew University, uh, retired colonel in the Israeli army, told me a story as we were talking privately. He said, you know, Marty, he said, when, when my sister, he said, we, we've been to Poland not too long back, and he said, my sister, who... Uh, 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 who was much older than him, he said she was several years older than me, she wanted to go to Poland. And I'm like, really, what were you going to do in Poland? He said, well, she was born many, several years before World War II. 
Now, this, had been, this experience must have been sometime prior to me getting to talk to him about it. But he said, she was born before World War II. And when the Nazis came to power in Germany, our parents, being Jewish, were very concerned. Then they invaded Poland, and we were very, very concerned. And he said, my parents took my sister and placed her into a convent so that she could be raised by the nuns and hopefully protected by the nuns from the, from the Nazis and wouldn't be killed. And so even though she was a little Jewish girl, she was raised in the convent and they taught her how to make the sign of the cross and genuflect and do the things that, that they do in a convent. And he said later in her life, she wanted to go back and see where she had been raised. Because after the war, his parents survived the war. They went and retrieved his sister. They raised her. She was Jewish, uh, ultimately lived in Israel. But he said she wanted to go back and see Poland where she had survived the war. He said when we went back to the convent where she was held during the war years and raised during the war years, he said my sister crossed over the threshold into the convent. And without even thinking about it, without even it coming across her mind, first thing she did was she made the sign of the cross and she genuflected. And she looked at him and she said, I haven't been here in like 60 years. I didn't mean to do that. But it had been ingrained into her that when you come in, you do certain things. You come in, you do certain things. You come in, you do certain things. What, what we are, are we are trainable people. We are people who, can rem, who are reminded by those kinds of things uh, about important you know, symbols or whatever in our life. We are trainable people. I want you to understand that when God gave that animal for Adam and Eve's covering, when God received Abel's sacrifice, when God gave the sacrifice for Isaac and, and, and uh, Abraham slay the ram there on Mount Moriah, when Moses and those people in Israel took the blood and put it on the doorpost and lentils, when they offered all those sacrifices in the Old Testament, God was training them, reminding them that one day the ultimate lamb is going to come and I want you to understand the ultimate lamb is going to be greater than anything you have ever experienced in your life because in Abel's day, it was one lamb given for one person's sin. And then in Egypt, it was one lamb given for one family's sin at the Passover. And then on the Day of Atonement, it was one lamb given for one nation's sin. But Jesus encompassed all of that and eclipsed all of that because in Jesus, it wasn't one man for one person or one man for one family or one man for one nation. But with Jesus, he is the Lamb of God slain for the sins of the whole world. Everybody's sin was placed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. What is our job today? Our job on Easter Sunday is to remind people that if He be lifted up from the earth, He will draw all men into Himself. And our job today is to lift up the Lord Jesus Christ and say that if you have not placed your faith in the one who was lifted up for you, you need to give your life to Him because you cannot have forgiveness of sin and eternal and abundant life without a relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, how did it all happen? Well, here in Luke 24, we see a conclusion. But there was a lot that went on before Luke 24. You see, on Good Friday, the day that shall live in infamy finally did arrive. It was the darkest day in human history. Jesus, the Son of God, betrayed by Judas, one of his closest friends, going through the mockery of a trial led by Caiaphas, the high priest. Jesus then, after going through the mockery of that trial, was taken by Roman soldiers and he was scourged. They beat him, not 40 lashes minus one, but they beat him with a flag a cat of nine tails mercilessly ripping chunks of flesh from his body. They finally march him out to Golgotha, the place of the skull, carrying his own cross. And when he went out to the place of the skull, finally they take him, they nail him to the cross at Calvary where he dies, giving his life for the sins of the world. His final words are, Eli, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As Martin Luther said, God forsaking God, who could ever understand that? But what Jesus did was ultimately yield up to his spirit father into thy hands I commit my spirit now ladies and gentlemen let me just tell you that if we had gone out on the streets of Jerusalem that day and if we had taken a television camera with us or maybe just a stenographer's notepad and gone out as reporters and if we had asked people on the streets of Jerusalem that day is it over they would have all said, yes, it's over. We've seen the Romans do this hundreds of times. Let me tell you, they know how to do it. It is over. If you'd asked Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him, is it over? He would have said, yes, it's over. I wish it weren't. I betrayed innocent blood, but yes, it is over. If you'd asked Caiaphas, the high priest of Israel, Caiaphas, is it over? He would say, yes, thank God, it is finally over. That 
troublemaking Galilean is finally dispensed with and we are thankful that it is over. If you had asked Pilate, Pilate, is it over? Pilate, that vacillating politician who gave Jesus up instead of a known criminal named Barabbas, he would have said, yes, I found no guilt in him. I know he was an innocent man, but I had to do what I did because of the politics of the situation. I didn't like it, but I'm glad that it's over. If you had asked that Roman soldier who had committed those uh, nails into the hands of Jesus and who had carried out the execution, is it over? He would say, yes, it's over. It's a nasty business and I've done it hundreds of times, but I've not seen one that wasn't over yet. Yes, sir, it is over. Well, what if you had asked the followers of Jesus about it? What if you had asked the disciples about it? Well, they would have said, yes, it is over as well. Because after Jesus has risen from the grave, he appears to two of his disciples on the road to Emmaus, and they are telling Jesus, whom they don't recognize, they were saying, we were hoping he was the one who was going to liberate Israel. We were hoping he was the prophet. We were hoping he was the Messiah. But to them, it was over. You see, they all thought it was over on Easter Sunday, but it wasn't over. You see, on Good Friday, they took down his lifeless body from the cross. They buried it in a borrowed tomb. They rolled a stone in front of that tomb. They sealed that stone with a Roman seal that if anybody broke that seal, they had committed a capital offense for which their life could be taken. And then Pilate said, let's post some guards out there. And those guards knew that if they didn't guard that tomb with their life, their lives would have been taken. If those, if those guards went AWOL, then they would have been burned in a fire started with their own military uniforms. That's the way Romans handled AWOL soldiers back in those days. They thought it was over and everything was taken care of. But yet, on Easter Sunday morning, what do we find? On Easter Sunday morning, we find that the seal was broken. We find that those soldiers did go AWOL. And later on, we hear Peter who says that God raised him to life. And we are all witnesses of this fact. And Jesus today is the living Savior and He is alive walking among His people. But let me ask you today, what does it all mean to you? What does all this mean to you and what does it have to do with your life? Let me give you three quick applications. Number one, because of Easter Sunday, we should never give up on a person. We should never give up on anybody. If there was anybody that the world gave up on, it was Jesus Christ. But on Easter Sunday, we realize we should never give up on anybody. The disciples had given up. His followers had given up. Everybody else thought that it was over. In fact, the story that I read to you from Luke 24, what is the story of Easter Sunday morning? The story of Easter Sunday morning is that women come to the tomb, verse 1, bringing spices which they had prepared. And they're bringing spices which they had prepared because they're completing the burial task because to them it was over they had given up on him they had said he is a good man and what we really need to understand is that these women had a whole lot more love for Jesus than they did faith in Jesus they loved him they cared about him they wanted him to have a proper burial but when they arrived on the scene, they too found two men in shining garments asking them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen. And then, as if to really uh, make an application for these ladies, they, he, they said, Don't you remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee? Don't you remember what he said? Well, what did he say when he was still in Galilee? Well, if you'll read Luke chapter 18, the Scripture says, He told them that I'm going up to Jerusalem, and all things written by the prophets are going to be fulfilled, and I'll be mocked and insulted and spat upon and scourged, and I'll be killed, but I will rise again on the third day, praise God. He had already told them that. He had already told them that he would die and he would be raised on the third day over and over. He had told them that. But they had more love for him than they did faith in him. And they had given up on him. Well, let's not get too angry with these ladies, by the way. I don't want to do that. Thank God they were even there on Easter Sunday morning. Weren't any men around. Peter was still hearing roosters crowing in his sleep. Thomas was still wondering, what have I given my life for all these last few years? I mean, James and John were still mad because they said, I'm not going to get the right hand and the left hand in the kingdom. I'm going to be a nobody again. And Matthew, what was he doing? He's probably out looking for his job back at the tax collector's booth. At least those ladies were there to show up and show a little affection for the Lord Jesus. You see, everybody had given up on him. But I want you to understand that because of Easter Sunday morning, we should never give up on anybody. And we have a problem in our lives where we do give up on people and we feel like they have gone too far. 
there are people in our lives and we think they have sinned too much, they have lied too much, they have done things too bad, they have run too far. They're never going to come and give their life to Christ. Listen, because of Easter Sunday, nobody is beyond reclamation. Nobody is beyond hope and nobody is beyond help. Jesus' resurrection ought to prove to us once and for all that your life is not too far gone. There is hope for you. You may say, Pastor, my marriage is too messed up. I'm too far in debt. My children are too rebellious. I mean, I am too broken to mend. I want to say to you that God is in the redeeming business. And if He can bring Jesus out of a borrowed tomb, He can bring you out of whatever pit you're in in your life. In fact, if you'll remember when Jesus was hanging on the cross dying for our sin, there was a thief on this side and there was a thief on that side. And one of those thieves was mocking and unwilling to repent and unwilling willing to acknowledge who Jesus was but the other one said remember me when you come into your kingdom and here was a man who was hanging on a cross and he deserved what he was getting he was a criminal he was one who deserved everything that was happening to him but Jesus said to him my brother today you will be with me in paradise when you close your eyes in death those eyes will awaken in paradise it'll be nothing more for you than stepping from one room into the next you'll be with me forever Thank God that nobody is beyond hope. What else should we learn from Easter Sunday? Well, because of Easter, we should learn that nobody uh, is beyond hope. And we should never give up on any person. But we also should remember we should never give in to any problem. Here on Easter Sunday morning, we find these ladies who are coming to the tomb and they're bringing their spices because they have a problem. And the problem is they couldn't complete his burial properly on Good Friday before uh, Passover began and before the Holy Day began. But here we find on Good Friday, or excuse me, on Easter Sunday morning, a wonderful truth. And that is we should never give in to any problem that we have. Good Friday was a depressing day for a lot of people. We call Good Friday not good because of all of the joyful things that happened that day. In fact, Good Friday, honestly, was the darkest day in the history of the world. As I said earlier, Martin Luther said, God forsaking God, who can understand that? I mean, Good Friday is a day that's hard for us even to, to put our minds around. And for the disciples, their hopes were dashed. Their dreams were gone. I mean, their experience of Good Friday made everything seem like a waste. They felt like it was all over. But here these ladies are coming to the tomb on Easter Sunday morning. They find that the tomb is empty. They find that the angel is there reminding them that Jesus is alive. And they go out according to Matthew 28 verse 8 from the tomb with joy. They had come with fear. They, had, they left then with joy. They run to bring the disciples word. And they learn in that moment that all of our problems have a solution. And all of our problems can be solved when we trust them to the resurrected Lord. Now let me just remind you of something. I find inspiration from a lot of different places. And I find inspiration in a lot of different things. And some of you are going to say, man, you're old when you bring this up. But let me tell you, I found inspiration once on Monday night football. You ever find any anything on Monday night football? Probably not because the announcers are terrible, but back in the day, Monday night football had great announcers. Howard Cosell, you know, you know, all those guys, Frank Howard, Dandy Don Meredith. I like Dandy Don Meredith. Dandy Don Meredith said one night on Monday night football, he said, if you sail the seas long enough, eventually you're going to run into some rough waters. I want you to know that if you sail the seas very long in life, you're going to run into problems in your life. And some of you have problems this morning. In fact, everybody in here has got a problem in some way or the other because there's only three kind of people in this room this morning. As I look out over this audience, there are three kinds of people that walk through those doors out there. There are those of you who are in trouble. There are those of you who just got out of trouble. And there are those of you who are about to get back into trouble. That's the only three kind of people we got in this place this morning. And you are in one of those three categories. You have issues and you have problems in your life, whether you like to admit it or not. In this world, you're going to have tribulation. But Jesus said, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. But here's what I want to say to you if you've got problems this morning. If God brings you to it, God has a way of bringing you through it. If God brings you to that issue, He'll bring you through that issue in your life if you'll only trust Him. I mean, think about the Israelites standing there before the Red Sea. They're trying to escape Pharaoh, whose army is chasing them there before the Red Sea, and they're wondering how we're going to get across. Well, listen, if God brings you to it, God will bring you through it. Think about those Israelites standing at the Jordan River. It's at flood stage, and they're like, how are we going to get across the Jordan River? He wants us to get into the Promised Land. We can't get over there. If God brings you to it, God will bring you through it. 
it. He will always do that. If there's a giant in your life and God brings you to that giant, He'll give you a slingshot and a stone to deal with that. If He brings you to it, He will find a way to bring you through it. And if God brings His Son to a borrowed tomb, He will find a way through that experience as well. And Easter Sunday morning tells us that there is no problem too great that God cannot solve it. We need to learn what Romans chapter 8, verse 28 says. When it says, All things work together for good to those who love the Lord and are the called according to His purpose. And I don't know everything that that verse teaches, but I know this. It teaches us that God is at work in the world. I know that it teaches us that God works for our good. And I know that it teaches us that God works for us. It doesn't teach us that everything that happens is good because it's not. It doesn't say that everything is caused by God because it isn't. And it doesn't say that everything is going to work out good for everybody because it won't. But it does tell us that God is going to work in all of our problems to ultimately bring good into our life if we will trust Him. And I hope that you realize on Easter Sunday morning that whatever problem you brought into this place today is not too great for God. Whether it's your marriage, your job, your family, whatever it is, it's not too great for God. But here's the third thing I want you to notice. I want you to notice not only that because of Easter we should never give up on any person, not only because of Easter we should never give in to any problem, but because of Easter we should never give over to our phobia. And you may say, well, what phobia are you talking about? Well, several years ago, I learned that I had a phobia that I was unaware of. I had to have this little MRI thing, and I didn't realize that I was claustrophobic. Now, I don't know if you've had one of those things, but mine wasn't even the whole tube. Mine was just like a little donut. And I'm telling you, I didn't like being in that thing. None. In fact, I was about to get up and just climb out of there. And I thought, man, that's weird. Maybe that's just a one-off. Well, then I had to go get a hearing test because I can't hear half the time. And so I had to go get this hearing test. And they put me in this little box and they said, raise your hand every time you hear a beep. I just said, hey, I want out of the box, man. That's all I wanted. I wanted out of that thing. I didn't realize that I was claustrophobic. I had no idea. Now, I don't even like going to the car wash, man. You go in the car wash and they cover your car up with soap and then they, you know, they put all those you know, things over it as they sweep over your car. I don't like that. When I go into the car wash, I make sure I got my phone on and I'm looking at my notifications, man. I got to have something to do when I go in the car wash because I have this phobia. I didn't even realize it was there. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a fear that all of us share. And you say, well, what is that fear? Well, millions of people are scared to death of dying. I think our greatest fear is dying. In fact, Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 says that people are held in slavery by their fear of death. Psalm 55 verse 4 says, My heart is in anguish within me, and the terrors of death have fallen on me. People are scared to death of death. Did you know, by the way, that the average life expectancy is continuing to rise? But in Jesus' day, in the Roman period, that the average Roman citizen only lived 22 years. 22 years. The lifespan rose to 35 years in the Middle Ages, but it didn't increase a lot until the 18th century. And by 1840, in Britain, it was 41. And in the U.S. in 1910, it was 52 and for men and 55 for women. And then after World War II, the life expectancy went to 66 for almost all Americans. And now the life expectancy is 78 and a half years old on average for everybody. Well, I'm grateful for that. But let me tell you what the death expectancy is. It is appointed unto man once to die. And after that, there's judgment. That's what the Hebrew writer tells us. And while death is certain, we don't have to be afraid of death. Because Jesus Christ has conquered death. And because of resurrection, we can face death with a calm assurance. Jesus, on Easter Sunday, transformed death from a conclusion to an introduction, from an ending into a beginning, from a period into a comma. And because He died, we can experience life abundant now, life eternal when we die. And we can say with the Apostle Paul, O death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? He can laugh at death. Because death for us now as a believer is nothing more, as I said, than just stepping from one room into the next. That's all that it is. To close your eyes in death is to open your eyes in glory. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, the Scripture says. And it all happens because He is the resurrection and the life. And he who believes in Him, even though he dies, yet shall he live through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And so because of Easter Sunday, we should never give up on any person. You've not gone too far today to be saved. Because of Easter Sunday, we should never give in to any problem. You don't have problems too great for God to solve. And because of Easter Sunday, you don't have to give in to the deepest phobia in your life. Because God has brought life out of death and victory out of defeat and success out of failure and triumph out of tragedy. And He's turned our Good Fridays into Easter Sunday mornings. I am so thankful for Easter Sunday morning. Thank God that there's going to be a great day for all of us who are saved and who are followers of Christ. And on that great morning we shall rise, we shall rise. And we shall rise because He has risen before us. I want to ask you today, have you given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you one who's placed your faith in Him today? Because if you haven't placed your faith in Him today, let me remind you of a hymn that was written way over 100 years ago, back in 1878. And the hymn asked us a question that I think we ought to consider today. That old hymn says, Have you been to Jesus for that cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Have you fully trusted in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? And I ask you that question from that old hymn for this reason. Because here we stand on Easter Sunday morning and we all need to be reminded that without the shedding of blood, what? There is no remission of sin. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And we've been trained to know that from the very beginning. And Good Friday was just the culmination of it all. When the Lamb of God took your sin and my sin upon Himself, God made Him who knew no sin to become sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. He became sin for you. And so today I simply want to tell you that nobody in this room needs to go to hell because of their sin. In fact, I would be so audacious as to say this. Nobody is going to, in this room is going to go to hell for their sin. Because you see... Your sin has been atoned for. Your sin has been covered. Your sin has been paid for. You say, well then, why would anybody go to hell? You don't go to hell for your sins. You go to hell because you have rejected the cure for your sin. Not because of sin. Jesus died for the sins of the world. He is the atoning sacrifice, not only for our sin, 1 John 2, 2, but for the sins of the whole world. Your sin was already taken to Calvary. And you will either trust Jesus who died for your sin or you will die in your sin. But the reason people are separated from God today is not because of sin. It's because they reject the cure. And that's the simple truth. I'm going to ask you to bow your head this morning. We're going to have our musicians come forward to give an invitation hymn, a hymn of response. And we're going to call you to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ right now. With heads bowed and with eyes closed, I want to ask you today, have you placed your confidence, your faith in Christ, having repented of your sins and trusted Him as Lord and Savior? And if you've not done that, what better day than Easter Sunday to have new life? Because if you'll place your faith in Christ, you'll have a new birth and you'll become a new creation and you'll have a new home and a new Jerusalem and a new heaven and a new earth and all things will be made new for you if you will only come and give your life in faith to Christ. You see, you don't need to worry about spending an eternity separated from Him. You simply need to thank Him that He sent His only begotten Son into the world, that whosoever believes in Him shall have everlasting life. And here on Easter Sunday, we celebrate Christ, who is alive. And the Bible says not only is He alive, but He walks among His churches. And today, He is walking up and down every aisle, he is walking by every seat. He is touching every heart. He is drawing all of you who don't have faith in Christ to Himself for salvation. He might be walking by whispering to you that you need to become an active member of this church and you'd like to transfer your membership here and engage in ministry. You may say, Lord, I want to serve the risen Christ. I want to grow in Christ. I want to be on mission for Christ and I'd like to join this church. We'll talk to you about your church membership or your salvation. Maybe God is calling you to a ministry. Perhaps God is calling you into His ministry. And you want to talk to us about following His leadership and ministry. Maybe He's calling you to mission. And you want to be part of our team that's going to Zambia. Who will be 
reaching out in the communities in Zambia and touching lives there or our teams that go to Mexico and are reaching and helping plant churches there. Maybe you want to be part of a ministry and God has spoken to you this morning. Listen, the risen Christ, the living Christ walks among His people this morning and He's calling you to Himself. Will you give your life and your commitment to Him? Father, we love you so much and we pray that all of our hearts will be open to the risen Christ And that as He walks among us today, convicting us through the work of the Holy Spirit, I pray that we will be obedient to His call. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Let's all stand together. Who will come? God sent His Son. He called Him Jesus. He came to love. Heal and Forgive He bled and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives because He. If you would, just to have a seat for a moment. I'm going to lead us in a prayer, and then our ushers are going to receive our offering. And so, if you will, bow with us. Our ushers are going to receive our offering, and as the plate comes by, be prayerful about what the Lord would have you to give. Father, we thank you for the way that you have blessed this body of believers here at Sandridge. I want to thank you for the great day that we have had on Easter Sunday, that you've blessed our services, you've added to your body, you have given to us a joyful time of celebrating the living Christ. I pray that as we give now of our tithes and of an offering above the tithe, that we will give with a grateful heart and also with a heart of anticipation at how our tithes and offerings are used to further the ministry of Christ in this place, but also around the world as the gospel is shared by our mission friends around the globe. Help us to be faithful in our stewardship. Help us to be thankful that we're able to give. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.
His name is victory this morning. Let's sing it out. Your name, your name is victory. Your name is victory. 